Zion in Sierra Leone. Brother, you had a wonderful service in Ghana and in Sierra Leone um, this morning. Praise God. So today we're going to go to the book of Revelation, chapter 5. And thank you, um, Pastor Lumbo, for the reading of the scripture. Amen. Amen. And uh, I just want to say that when we are studying these books of Revelation, it's difficult to split it in two. Amen. Amen. So what I'm asking the congregation is to be patient. Because the book of Revelation, and I'll keep saying this, is very important for us as believers to understand the book of Revelation. And as we go from chapter to chapter, as we get into the middle of the book, you begin to understand why. Amen? Amen. Begin to understand why. I don't want to be like the foolish virgins. Amen? And once we understand the book of Revelation, there's nothing to be afraid of as a believer. In fact, all you'll be looking for is towards the coming of Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. So I just want you to be patient because, you know, uh, chapter 5 is a very, 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 you know, instrumental chapter in the whole of the book of Revelation. Amen? So if you notice, because last week I was saying that, you know, chapter 4 is very important. And if you notice that this, the, 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 the chapter started with the word and, what does that mean? And is a connecting word. Because what, because we all know that the Bible, the scroll, was not written, it was not spread in chapters and verses. Okay, but when you know, the, the, the Bible was, when it was canonized, what happened was that they had, they had to be split in chapters and verses for us to understand. So sometimes that's why if you are studying the Bible, or it's best to read the whole chapter and then you go into the next chapter, two or three verses for you to get the whole picture. So when it's, when, 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 whenever you see a chapter starts with and, I will recommend you go back to the previous chapter and read it because it's connecting these two chapters and that's what chapter 4 and 5 so chapter five, 4 and 5 are connected Amen? Amen? Praise God So in chapter 4, you know, we, we, we talked about how John, you know, gave us a description of heaven talked about the throne of God trying to give us a description of God and also everything that was surrounding the throne Amen? But in chapter 5, it uh, constitutes what may be the most important chapter in the entire book of Revelation. Have, have you ever tried to button a shirt? Alright? And when you button your shirt, you realize that you missed a buttonhole. So there was one, there's one buttonhole too many and there's one button too many. Alright? Because it's not aligned. And, and, and that's, what I, that's what I want us to see, you know, is because we don't want to leave too many holes in chapter five four and five amen so it's important for us to get it right from the beginning and that's why i'm saying you know don't look at the time forget about the time all right you're going to spend plenty of time in heaven worshiping and praising god but when it comes to the word of god i just want to take my time and teach the word of god amen praise god and um so i just want us to go to to, to, to verse five amen because if we misunderstand what is taking place in chapter 5 will misunderstand the rest of the book of revelation so in verse 1 in verse 1 we are told about the scroll okay so now the scroll that in you know, revelation talks about happens to be the most important document in all of history amen and we all know that in the united states of america there is a constitution right the declarance, you know, uh, declaration of independence is in that constitution. It's an important document, but nothing compared to the significance of the scroll that John is talking about in the book of Revelation. In fact, when you think about it, okay, that scroll represents the title deed of the earth. Are you with me? Those of you who are homeowners, you know what I'm talking about. You've got the title deed to your property. Amen. So, and so we are given an example, you know, uh, of what is scroll refers to in the book of Jeremiah 32, 6 to 15. And I'm not going to read all of that for time, but let me just give you a preamble of what that scripture is about. Because this is when God revealed to Jeremiah, 
you know, that you know, Jerusalem was going to be overthrown by the king of Babylon. So Jeremiah had to ask his cousin, because the Lord told him that his cousin is coming to him to sell a piece of land. So Jeremiah <coughs> had his cousin, his name was um, Hanamiel, who came, who had a piece of property to sell. So God told Jeremiah to buy this property from his cousin as a sign that one day God's people return to this land. Amen. So when Jeremiah bought the property, the title deed was given to him. All right, but when you read the scripture, we'll go into detail of how that transaction took place, how much was exchanged, who we are present, the kings and all the councilmen and all the people we are present when this document was signed. Amen. Mm -hmm. and, and so that's just what the title deed is. So now when that land was handed over to Jeremiah, in fact, God told him exactly in, in verse 15 how that document should be safeguarded. Amen. Again, nothing compared to the scroll we're talking about. But you just want to paint a picture in your mind as how important a deed property is. Amen. So the scroll that John says in this chapter is the title deed of the earth. Amen. So God intended for his people to inhabit this earth and to be in control of the earth. But of course, Satan has seized man's throne without any authority whatsoever. He took it from the first Adam. And now he's exercising dominion over the earth. And this scroll, this scroll is the official document that will determine the final outcome of human history. Amen. So now, the focal point of this scene shifts from chapter 4, all right, where, as I said, John was describing the throne of God, all right, he was in the throne room of heaven. But now we see the introduction of the Lamb, all right. The introduction of the Lamb in chapter 5. Amen? So Jesus is referred to as the Lamb only twice in the Old Testament. Because when you go to the book of Isaiah 33, 7 and, and Jeremiah eleven nineteen, you know, that's the only time he was referred to too. Okay? And then he's referred to as the Lamb twice in the Gospel. As in, in John chapter 1, 29 and verse 36. And only once in the book of Acts. In Acts chapter 8, 32, and only once in the epistle, which is in 1 Peter 1 19. Okay, that's the only time that Jesus was mentioned, not too many times in the Old Testament, in the Gospel as well, and in the epistle. But in the book of Revelation, all right, Jesus is referred to as the Lamb. In this chapter alone, he was referred to four times as the Lamb. And the entire book of Revelation, he was referred to 28 times as the Lamb. Okay? But let's look at the preeminence of, of, of the lamb, because sometimes we we, 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 we we get confused, we interchange the word lamb and lion, what does that mean? We'll get to that, okay, because we need to understand when we talk about the lamb, what it means, when we talk about the lion, what it means, I mean, and we'll get to that. But I want us to look at the preeminence of the lamb, because verse 2, you know, in, in verse 2, we are immediately presented with a very strange scene, okay, in verse 2. Uh, of chapter 5 of um, Revelation because an angel comes forth and then all of a sudden asking a question he said who is worthy to open this scroll and lose its seal so this question was met with deafening ears there were people sitting there because we are told that in verse 3 that no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth will be able to open this scroll or to look at it. Amen? So now, there have been many who are willing to take title deed of the earth in this world. Just going back historically, Alexander the Great, okay? this was a brilliant ruler, a very young man back in the days in Rome when his father died, he took over and he did what most of the magnificent buildings you see was actually erected by him. But Alexander the Great, you know, tried to take over the world. And he did conquer all the world that he knew. Okay? But he didn't conquer the world that he did not know. Napoleon tried to conquer the world, but he met his Waterloo. Adolf Hitler had it in his heart to control the entire world. In fact, with Adolf Hitler, he just wanted to change the entire race. Okay? To populate the world with, with, with a master race. But he failed miserably. Because the reason is, the Bible didn't say who is willing 
All right? The question here is, for who is worthy? Do you understand? Mm -hmm. Amen? So it's, the Bible says, a search was begun throughout the entire universe. It said, it looked in the heavens, which is where God works. Okay? Controlling the entire universe. They search in the heavens. They looked on the earth. They joined the place of men. They looked under the earth, where there are dead people. But no one was found worthy, worthy to touch the scroll. What does that tell you? He said, they looked in the heaven, but no one was worthy. Michael the angel was there. All right, he was a powerful angel. Of all the nations of, of Israel. But he kept silent. Gabriel, the greatest trumpeter in heaven, kept silent. He couldn't say a word. The prophet Isaiah couldn't say a word. He was the one who said, Here I am, send me, send me. But now he couldn't say a word. Peter was there, who said, I will never leave you, nor deny you. He couldn't say a word. He held his tongue. James and John, who said, We want to sit on either side of you in the kingdom of heaven, they took that silence. They couldn't say a word. No prophet, no patriarch, no preacher could be found to open the scroll. They looked on the earth but could find no one. No one in the world of science could open the scroll. No one in the world of philosophy could open the scroll. No one in the world of politics had the influence to open the scroll. No president, no king, no prime minister, no dictator could step forth and say, I will open the scroll. They looked under the earth. Neither the devil, nor his demons, nor the heart of hell <coughs> put together could open the scroll. Now this was a tremendous strategy. And according to the Bible, it says that it broke John's heart. For we read in chapter 4, so John said, I, So I wept much because no one was found worthy to open and read the scroll or to look at it. And that's verse 4. So now why was John broken hearted? Why was he so upset? Because John knew that if this scroll was not opened, there would never be tribulation for the wicked. There would never be the restoration of Israel. There would never be the reign of Christ over all the earth if that scroll was not opened. And even our prayer thy kingdom come will never be answered and worst of all satan will forever reign over this earth but just as it looks that all is lost this is what verse 5 says it says one of the elders said to me do not weep behold the lion of the tribe of judah the root of David has prevailed to open the scroll and to loose its seven seals. There is no one who is worthy. Only one person is worthy and his name is Jesus. And, the, and chapter 7 says, Then he came and took the scroll out of the right hand of him who sat on the throne. Now why? Of all the created beings, who have ever lived is only Jesus Christ who is worthy. Why is that? Let, let, let's go to the scripture and, 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 and analyze this from verses. You know, let's go to verse. In fact, let's go to the previous chapter, chapter 4, verse 11. This is what it says. It says, You are worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things, and by your will they exist and were created. And the reason why Jesus, and Jesus alone is worthy, is because he made this world. This world has the stamp of Jesus Christ on it. Everything on this earth has the mark of Jesus on it. If it wasn't made by Jesus Christ, it didn't exist. And one of the greatest statements of the deity of Jesus is found in the book of Colossians. Chapter 1, 16 to 17, and I'll read. It says, For by him, I was talking about Jesus Christ, all 
things were created that are in heaven and that are on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things consist. So, why does he deserve the title deed of the earth? Because Jesus made it. He created it. It is rightfully belongs to him. The earth rightfully belongs to Jesus Christ. Because he made it. He created it. Amen? So we said that the reason why is because he's worthy of creation. And the other reason is because he's worthy because of the cross. Amen? And let's go to um, verse 9 in Revelation 5. This is what verse 9 says. It says, You are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seal. For you were slain and have redeemed us to God by the blood out of every tribe and tongue and people and nations. So Jesus not only created this world, when this world, but this world got lost and fell through man. But he brought it back. He gave his blood on the cross of Calvary. Not only to redeem a rebellious world, but also to restore a ruined creation. So this redemption is described in the book of Romans 8.21. This is what this Romans 8.21 says. It says, because the creation itself also will be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. So this world as it is now, is not the way that God wanted it to be. God created it not to be this way, and God does not intend this world to continue to be this way. Amen? Because one day, the deserts will blossom. The roses will grow one day without thorns. Amen? And the honeys will be provided with all the bees. Amen? But today we are living in paradise lost. It was lost by the first Adam. But it has been redeemed by the second, and I would say the last Adam, who is Jesus Christ, by the shed blood of Jesus. Amen? You know, just imagine that you created something of value, okay? And then you lost it. And then one day you're walking and you saw this item that you created, that you made, in a thrift store for sale, and you went to the owner of the store and said, Sir, that item belongs to me. Can I have it back? Mm -hmm. And he says to you, no, you cannot have it back. However, if you want it, it is for sale. You have to buy it. Mm -hmm. So you went home, got every penny that you had, and went and purchased that item. It's the same with Jesus Christ. So you owned that item twice. It was yours when you made it. It was stolen from you. But you redeemed it. So it becomes yours twice over. Amen? Amen. So, and the third thing that made Jesus to be worthy is worthy because of the crown. Let's go to verse 5. It says, He is of the root of David. Amen? Amen. So, David in the Bible represents what? He represents a royal royalty, he is in the line of kings. So you see, Jesus was also the root of Abraham and the root of Moses and of Elijah as well. But primarily, he was of the root of David because David is the preeminent king of God's people. Amen? And the kingdom of this world belonged to him of the line and of the lineage of King David. Praise God. You see, Satan was never called the king of the world. He is not. He's called what? The prince of darkness. The prince, you know, of the power of this age. That's what Satan is called. Nobody ever says Satan is the king of the world, right? Because the world does not belong to him. He's actually, you know, a prince on a world that belongs to somebody else. So one day Jesus Christ, the king of kings, is coming to take back his rightful place as the ruler of this world. He made it with his own hands. He bought it with his blood. He was promised by his heavenly father that one day he will unroll the scroll and exercise his sovereignty over the world. Praise God. Amen. You see, Jesus Christ 
is not the world's best hope. I know you are looking at me funny now. Jesus is not even the world's religious hope. Jesus is the world's only hope. Amen. Oh, how many are willing today? But he is alone. He is worthy. Many are desiring. But he alone is desiring. Many are prominent. But he alone is preeminent. Let's look at the fourth thing here. Because now, we've talked about the worthiness of Jesus Christ. Amen? I want us to just paint a picture of the Lamb. Because we need to understand what the difference between the Lamb and the Lion. But let's look at the picture of the Lamb. Amen? And let's go to verse 6. And verse 6 says, And I looked, and behold, in the midst of the throne, and of the four living creatures, and in the midst of the elders, stood a Lamb. Okay? Now it's amazing that in chapter 4, when John was in heaven, he saw the throne. He was, you know, in his throne room. How did he miss the lamp? Because the Bible says that the lamp was right in the middle. Alright? But he described God and he described all these other, you know, angelic things around the throne. You know? And so how could he have missed it? When he was right in the middle. But John was taken away by the emerald rainbow, the sea glass, the cherubims, the elders, the living creatures, the thundering and the lightning. So as he completely missed the lamb, yet the lamb was in the middle of everything. Amen? Amen. You know, heaven is going to be a wonderful sight. Mm -hmm. It will be marvelous for all of us to see the gates of Paul. It will be wonderful to walk on the golden streets in heaven. Amen? Amen. It will be precious for you to just bask in the light of that emerald rainbow. It, it will be fascinating to hear the legions of angels, thousands and thousands and ten thousand, to see him praising God. Amen. What a wonderful sound that would be. It will be interesting to see that we want to walk on the glass Amen. and the sea of glass. How marvelous that would be because the last time I told you what the sea of glass represents, the word of God. Amen. Amen. Uh, and it will be refreshing to drink from that river of life. It will be stimulating to walk with Abraham, David, Moses, Peter, or whoever that you want to, you know, is your, 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 your own person that you want to, to talk to. Wouldn't that be marvelous to say, oh, uh, my mansion is just next to Moses's. Mm. You know. Oh yeah, yeah, I just bumped into Abraham and we had this discussion, we had a question for him. Who would have been marvelous? But without Jesus Christ, there is no heaven. There is no heaven without Jesus. For what makes heaven? It's Jesus that makes heaven. So if you want to enjoy and bask in the presence of Jesus, then you only have one option. And that is to accept Jesus Christ as your Lord, your Master, and your Savior. Amen. Because here we see that John uses his, his zoom lens to go straight into the heart of the Lord Jesus Christ. And notice how he describes the, 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 the lion here. He says, it, wait, let's go back to verse 5. He says, Jesus is the lion of the tribe of Judah. So, in, in, in Genesis um, 49, 8 to 10, you know, Jacob, you know, prophesies that it is from the tribe of Judah that the Messiah will come from. Okay? He also describes the offspring of Judah as a lion whelp. And when you talk about a lion whelp, the word whelp means a young offspring of an animal. Okay? So in this case, when we talk about the, the, the lamb, the lamb is a baby. Okay? That's what we're talking about here. All right? And so he says about the lion that this Santa shall not depart from Judah nor a Lord giver from between his feet until Shiloh comes and to him shall be the obedience of the people. And that's in the same Genesis 49, 9 to 10. Now, we know that the lion, we know the lion, you know, we always tell the lion is what? It's the king of the jungle. Alright? 
So this speaks of the kingly um, character of the lion. And also speaks of the kingly character of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, who is coming to this earth to rule and reign over all the earth. And so, but most of the time, we, 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 we describe Jesus Christ as a gentle, you know, Jesus, meek and mild. That's how a lot of people see Jesus. Amen. And I tell you, but he's coming to this earth as a lamb, the tribe of Judah, as a king, as a judge, to take vengeance on all those who have rejected him. So he's not coming as a lamb this time. He's coming as what? As a lion. He's coming to pass judgment this time on those who have rejected him. And, and, and verse 6 talks about how precious the lamb is. So now John turns, is full, you know, fully expecting to see a lion when he was sitting there. Maybe that's why he missed it in chapter 4. Because he was expecting a lion. But a lamb was there. Because John was expecting to see a, a, a lion. That's what he says in verse 6. And I looked and behold in the midst of the throne and of the four living creatures and in the midst of the elders to the lamb. That was what he saw is to the Lamb. Here in the middle of the throne, the elders, the very center of heaven, stands a Lamb. And now, as I said, a Lamb means a little pet. It's a small animal, just born. That's what a Lamb is, okay? That's a baby. There's nothing so weak. There's nothing so helpless. There's nothing so defenseless as a little Lamb. Praise God. You know, I, I read this story of a man who was a butcher, he walks, he kills, you know, the sheep for them to go, when, as they come through the shoot to go to the slaughterhouse, he kills the sheep. And he's done that for years. And then one day in the shoot, there was a lamb, just a baby lamb. And he stuck the knife into the heart of this lamb. And the blood splattered all over his arm. But as this lamb was dying, the lamb stuck out his tongue and began to lick the blood off the hand of this man. And the man put down his knife and said he will never do that job again and walked away. Praise God. Amen. You see, now remember that in Revelation, Satan is a great demon. All right, so that's one. Okay? The Antichrist is described as the beast of the sea. That's two. Amen. And there's a false prophet who completes the counterfeit Trinity three. So these three. Satan, the dragon, the antichrist, the false prophets are the counterfeit trinity of hell. Amen? Against these three evil people, they, 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 these are the enemies of God who have populated this earth. Millions and millions of them. But then God sent a precious lamb. So just imagine. You take your lamb and toss it to the lions and the elephants and the giraffes. What's going to happen to that lamb? There was not a lion. There was a lamb that was sacrificed on our behalf. Are you with me? That the lamb is precious in his sacrifice. Verse 6 says, as though it had been slain. John immediately recognized Jesus by the wound that was on his hand. The only man-made thing that we are going to see in heaven is the mark on Jesus Christ on his hands and his feet. That's the only thing that we're going to see. We're going to recognize because that's what Doubting Thomas recognized. That's what he wanted to see. He wanted to see proof and Jesus showed him his hands and his feet to prove that he was Jesus Christ. So Israel recognized him by those wounds. For some who will say, and this is what Zechariah 13, 6 says, what are these wounds in your hands? Then he will answer, those with which I was wounded in the house of my friends. Mm. That's the response that Jesus will give. But the lamb is also precious in his stance. For we see this lamb, the, the Bible says that the lamb was standing. All right? This lamb was not sitting, was not lying. The lamb was standing. Not only is he the redeeming lamb, he is the resurrected lamb. I mean, somebody once wrote years ago in a book entitled Satan is Alive and Well on Planet Earth. When I say, I want to say that Jesus is alive and well on the throne of heaven. You see, the head that was once crowned with thorn is now crowned with glory. It's now crowned with diadem that, that, that adorns the brow. 
You know, when they placed the thorn of crown on the head of Jesus Christ, it was blood was dripping out of him. But now when you see him in heaven, he's going to have the diamond, the diadem. And those are all greatly beautiful ornaments that you will see in Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Now do not think it is inconsistent or incongruous to see Jesus both as a lion and a lamb. Okay? It is not confusing. Alright? But just bear with me. It says, for as a lamb, he is our redeemer. Amen? Amen. As a lion, he is our ruler. As a lamb, he is our savior. As a lion, he is our sovereign. As a lion, he was prophesied in the Old Testament. As a lamb, he is pictured in the New Testament. So that's the difference between the lion and the lamb. Are you with me? Praise God. Amen. Let's go to verse 16. He says, we're looking at Jesus Christ as the perfect Lord. We are told that this lamb had seven horns, seven eyes. Okay, let me just check that out. He had seven on seven eyes, verse 14. So once again, we are reminded that the number seven represents perfection, right? Mm -hmm. Fullness and completeness. And we know that when we talk about a horn in the Bible, what does that signify? It signifies power and strength, right? Mm -hmm. And the eyes are the symbol of perfection and knowledge. All right, so we're talking about the, 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 the seven seals here, okay? And I'll, I'll go through that once again. We're talking about, again, it's a reminder that seven represents perfection, fullness and completeness. So the horns in the Bible are a symbol of power and strength. The eyes are a symbol of perfection and knowledge, all right? So here we have perfect power, perfect wisdom, and perfect presence. In Jesus Christ. Are you with me? Praise God. In other words, the Lamb is omnipotent, okay, which means He has perfect power and authority and can exercise it. All right. The Lamb is also omniscient, which means He has perfect wisdom. All right. And also, the Lamb is omnipresent, which means He has perfect presence. All right. And when we talk about omnipresence, and we talk about the presence of Jesus, it means that he is present, not just in one place, but he's present everywhere. So he is right here, he's in a church in Australia, in India, in wherever the world, he is present. Okay, so that's what it means by omnipresent. Okay. And this is also coincides with what you know First Corinthians 1 24 says. It says, Where we are told that Christ is the power of God and the wisdom of God. Right? So the scripture confirms that. So now the only being in the universe that's omnipotent, omniscient, and omnipresent is God. And you see Jesus is the lion, and the lion is the lamb, and the lamb is the Lord Jesus Christ, because Jesus Christ is Lord. Amen? Amen. And that is why the lamb is worshipped, because the lamb is the Lord. Praise God. Amen. Let's go down in, 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 in verse 7. Because here we talk, let's go to the praises now. Because we, we, we're going to talk about the praise. Because in verse 7, we are told that the Lamb who is worthy is that he came and took the scroll out of the right hand of him who sat on the throne. Amen. Amen. So what did he take? He took the title deed of the earth. He took that deed, all the earth. Is as in the right hand, and the Messiah had been promised the possession of this world. Because if we go to the book of Psalm 2 8, it says, A promise is given to the Messiah. Ask of me, and I will give you the nations for your inheritance and the ends of the earth for your possession. So we also learn in Hebrews chapter 1 2 that Christ has been appointed here of all things. Okay. So when a lamb takes a scroll, all heaven breaks loose. Every eye is now focused on the lamb. Every tongue is giving praise to that lamb. 
from heaven above to heaven below the lamb is honored and glorified praise god and, and verse 9 talks about the celebration of the savior They've prayed the lamb. They've praised the lamb. This was the very lamb that was thrown to the fools of God, the enemies of God, who killed him. But now in heaven, everybody's going to worship him. Everybody's going to praise his name. Amen? Amen. So now verse 9 tells us about the celebration of the Savior. Because it says, sang a new song. This song was a gospel song. And it says, for you, we are slain and have redeemed us to God by your blood out of every tribe and tongue and people and nation. And that word they are slain, it means to be to, to, to in a, the, 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 there's a prefix to that. It means violently slain. Right? So Jesus was violently slain. And that is the song about the cross of Calvary and the blood of Jesus Christ that they were singing in heaven. You know, I can just imagine the song that they will be singing. Yeah, and uh, some of those songs are familiar to us. Redeem how I love to proclaim it. The old rugged cross. There's power in the blood. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Praise God. But today we find out that most churches are removing the word of blood of Jesus. They're trying to water down you know, the hymns. And they're removing certain things from the hymns. Well, we can water it down on earth but you won't get songs you'll be able to water it down in heaven because the hymns in heaven will never change because we'll be talking about the blood of jesus we're talking about the cross of calvary as we glorify jesus amen, amen. and i just want to tell you this something as i come to a close i want to tell you that for all eternity will never ever be allowed to, forgot, to, to be forgotten. Nor will we want to forget how God's dear lamb, Mary little lamb, died for us. And as the, the, the Bible says, there were thousands and thousands of angels that were singing his praise. You just kind of, you, you just begin to imagine that crescendo of praise, you know, that reaches that, 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 that fever pitch. And that's why from verses 11 to 12, this is what verses 11 to 12 says, it says, Then I looked and I heard the voice of many angels around the throne, the living creatures and the elders, and the number of them was 10,000 times 10,000, and thousands of thousands saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive the power, and the riches, and wisdom, and strength, and honor, and glory, and blessing. Now, let me go through that one slowly. I don't even, let, let's count this together. This is what it means. Because here we are talking about the sevenfold doxology. Okay? This is what it says. What did he say? He said, This is the Lamb. It, it talks about the riches, the wisdom, the strength, the honor, the glory, and the blessings. Okay? He is one of all of those. There are seven there. Am I right? You want to follow? Yes. He receives power, he receives riches, wisdom, strength. Honor, glory, and blessing. That's the seven doxology from chapter 11. And what does doxology mean? It means him. It means praise. That's the highest praise that we can give to God. That's doxology. Okay. Because, why? Because a perfect Lord deserves a perfect praise. Again, seven signs for what? Perfection. Are you, beginning to, you, are you with me mm -hmm. so far? And I believe each one of these qualities represents everything that Jesus did not get the first time he came to this earth. Nobody praised him. But he will receive when he comes the second time. He came in weakness, but he will reign in power. He became the poorest of the poor, but unto him belong the riches and the universe. Men call him foolish, but he is the wisdom of ages. Men mocked his meekness but he will be praised for his strength he was butchered like a lamb but he'll be received and honored as a king he was rejected in shame but he'll be bathed in glory 
and became a cause for sinners, but he will receive the blessings of the saint. But then the, 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 when we go on to verse 13, the praise continues. And let's look at verse 13. Verse 13 says, And every creature which is in heaven, and on earth, and under the earth, and such as are in the sea, and all that are in them, I heard saying, Blessing and honor and glory and power to be to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb forever and ever. Yeah. That's verse 13. But when we read 11 to 12, we talk about the seven doxology, right? Mm -hmm. But in verse 13, it's only four doxology there. Amen? Yeah. Now, now we see that this second praise is, a, you know, which is, as I said, is a fourfold doxology. If you remember, you know, we said, well, what does number four stand for? It stands for what? It's the number of creation, right? Mm -hmm. So this represents all of God's creation. Giving all his praise to the one God who created it. And that name is Jesus Christ. So that's what the verse 13 is talking about. The fourth doxology. The completeness of the earth. That is Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 So from every corner of the universe. There rings out this acknowledgement. At last. That Jesus Christ. Lord. Praise God. Amen. There will not be a single dissenting voice in heaven. Amen. Even the fallen angels, the demons, Satan himself, every wicked person, all those who rejected Jesus Christ, sinners of this world, who once and for all acknowledge Jesus Christ as Lord. Amen. You may decide whether or not to accept him as your savior, but one day everyone will acknowledge him as God. Everyone is going to give praise to him, unto him who is worthy. And I close on this. Verse 14. It says, Then the four living creatures said, Amen. And the 24 elders fell down and worshipped him who lives forever and ever. If you are saved and you truly know Jesus Christ, there should be an amen in your heart this afternoon. Amen. Oh, you can do better than that. Amen. amen. There should be a swelling within your heart this very moment. Man, Do you believe he's worthy? Yeah. Amen. If you do, there should be a desire this very moment to just fall on your face and begin to worship it. Amen. And what I'm going to ask the choir to do this afternoon, I just want us to stand on our feet. Let's just worship God.